Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for meeting me tonight, meeting with us. Welcome to Table Talk. I am your host, Yvette Gallinar, and uh, this is a, a topic where we, or a segment, I should say, where we dive into uh, deeper content with a biblical perspective. And tonight, I have with me my friend and uh, returning guest, Ryan Peterson. Welcome, Ryan, once again to Table Talk. Yvette, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be back. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always good to get you back maybe every couple months. I know you're a busy guy. You're always traveling and you've got a lot on your plate with work and family and your ministry. So I always, always appreciate your time, uh, taking the time and Absolutely. spending it with me. So I do, do appreciate that. But for those of you that may uh, be new to our program and may not know who Ryan is, I can't imagine you not knowing who Ryan Peterson is. But in any case, let me do a little bit of intro. Uh, Ryan is the author of Amazon's number one bestsellers, Judgment of the Nephilim and The Final Nephilim. Those two books are absolutely amazing, read both of them. Uh, they changed my perspective when I first read them uh, several years ago. We had that talk when we had our fir first table talk. Uh, but he also has a companion study uh, guide for each of his books. So we will encourage you at the very end here on how to get those because those are really good materials for you to get your hands on. Uh, Ryan is a biblical researcher and writer with an emphasis in ancient Hebrew thought and theology. And he received his BA from the University of Rochester and his JD from Columbia University Law School. Am I missing anything? I think you got it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you, Ryan, so much. I saw you recently on Tipping Point with uh, Pastor Jimmy Evans, as a matter of fact. Meant to tell you that. Yeah, earlier. that was great. I, I was really um, just thrilled to be invited on with Pastor Jimmy. It was a, uh, it was a fun time. It was exciting, and it was a, uh, and I'm glad it aired because I, I actually recorded that several months ago, and so yeah, um, right. they oh. they told me it was going to air in July, and it actually aired at the end of June, the first episode. So I, I someone emailed me and said, "Hey, I just saw you on Tipping Point." I'm like, "Oh, it's on." Yeah. So it was a, it was a very pleasant surprise, but yeah, it was a great time being on that program. That's awesome. I we partner with uh, with Tippy with uh, Pastor Jimmy Evans. Tipping Point is his show, and we love that. We love his show, and I get you know I get uh, notification on all all the time. And when I saw your name come through, I said, "Oh, let me go check it out. I got to see what <laughs> Ryan has to say." And you were there for two uh, parts, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah two episodes. Yeah. Great, great material. Um, uh, great show, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, and he's in Texas where you are. Is that right? He is. He's in Dallas. So, yeah. um, so yeah, so which made it even better. Yeah. So I got to, not only could I go and it was easy to get there, we, I got to really spend time with him and, uh, his son, uh, Brent and people from the ministry. And so they were all really kind. We went to eat and had a great time. And so it was easy to be laid back because I wasn't rushing to catch a plane or having to go to right. a hotel. So it was great. It was a really, it was a blessing. Was that your first time on the show there? Yeah, it was. It was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I I didn't think I had seen you there before. So when, when you were his guest, I, I definitely had to take a look and see what was going on there. So it was great. It was great to hear you. Yeah. A um, lot of fun. Ryan, I've got a ton of questions for you tonight. Are you ready for me? Are you ready, ready. for our audience? <laughs> I am ready. I'm ready. Let's have some fun. Nothing better than get into God's word. I love it. I love it too. And you know, we we always want to get deeper into all of those type of scripture verses. You know, maybe one of these days we can do a segment where we can pick some of the uh, verses where, you know, it's like you get scratch your head kind of verses. Like, what is God saying here? So maybe sure. we can do that one of these days. Um, but I think we're going to get a little bit on it tonight, though. Probably. <laughs> Probably so. Uh, let, yes. Let's dive right in, because one right. of the things that you and I talk about um, on the we've been you've been on our show already twice. This is your third yes. time. And yes. uh, we've touched on quite a number of topics already. Uh, so I encourage folks to go back and listen to those. But, you know, I. I keep wanting to touch on several topics, especially as I've read your book and or both books, really, uh, Judgment of the Nephilim and 
and the final Nephilim, you cover so much material there. And one of the things that I absolutely love about both your books is that you, you, it's not just youth, you know, you writing, or this is your thought, or this is what you think. No, you really back it up with scripture. And, and that's one of the main things that I love about your content, because it's not as if you're, you know, giving your, just your opinion on something, you know, and it's fine. We can give our opinion. Right. But when you back it up with scripture, it, it carries so much more weight. Um, but there, <clears throat> there are countless of what I, what I say as seemingly unexplained and mysterious uh, passages that are in the Bible. There are many, many yes, mysterious ones. And, and some are, some are, explained and some are to be revealed i i would say um but one of the references that i believe stumps a lot of people a lot of christians is the phrase sons of god sons of god we read that throughout the bible in many many uh, for, uh, verses and then we have scriptures referring to god standing in a group of what appears to be angels called god's little g's Right. And right, so, sure. um, for example, we find uh, in Psalm 82, which I know you cover, you've covered at length. We, we see some of those examples in Psalm 82. The book of Job is another really good example, you know, just to name a couple. But who are these sons of God? And is there a difference between some of them? Are they good? Are they evil? Are they both? And <laughs> What yes. does all of this have to do with the divine council? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to sure. wind you up and let you go. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. I appreciate it. And you know, you know, just to start off, to go back to what you said about mysteries in the Bible. You know, the Bible is such an amazing book. I was actually uh, spending time. I actually got dinner with my with my mother tonight, who you know is a very passionate student of the Bible, yeah. and taught me. My, my, I always say she's my first Bible teacher, and it's funny because she said, you know, even now she's still questioning me about the Bible. And she said to me this this evening, she said, you know, she goes, you know, like really, she goes, you know, everything that we really think about and interact with and see in this world, no matter what it is, the Bible is going to touch on it. And I said, yeah. And she said, do you really believe that? And I said, yes. I said, yes, I do. I said, yeah. I, said, I just wrote a book where I said quantum physics is in the Bible. So I said, I definitely believe that everything is in the Bible, right? So, and so, but there are mysteries. So the Bible is a very simple book and a very complex book at the same time, right? So, you know, again, which in physics is called superposition, right? Because God exists in multiple states. And so it's, it, the gospel couldn't be more simple, right? Believe upon Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins and ye shall be saved right. right the most beautiful message in the world is so simple you don't have to do anything you don't have to perform an action it's in your heart right, right? and a five-year-old can understand that mm -hmm. however at the same time, there are many complex ideas in the Bible, especially obviously dealing in prophecy and the supernatural. And God says in his word that he is hiding things, right? Mm -hmm. It's the glory of God to conceal it of thing, right? This is what God does, but it's the honor of kings to search a matter out. So that's what God wants us to do, to search the scriptures, to understand these mysteries. Because one, we get truth, we get revelation, but two, it brings us closer to him. So I just want to, you know, you touched on that. And sometimes people, even the word mystery, people say, hey, why do you think there, why do you say there are mysteries in the Bible? God doesn't make anything mysterious. But yet, no, God actually says, yes, I do. I am concealing things and I want you to find them. And so I commend you and your ministry because you, you're encouraging people to do exactly what God wants to do. This is how we grow, right? And so, so the divine counsel, the sons of God, Benaiha Elohim, in Hebrew, you know, these are angels. First off, we're talking about angels. And, you know, Psalm 82 is one of these chapters that gives us a peek into the divine realm, into the unseen realm, into heaven. And so it's really an amazing passage. And, you know, again, like you said, it says, you know, I'm, I'm reading from the KJV. It says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And it's a really interesting passage because I think here it's really referring to fallen angels. 
And because God is, is rebuking them. He says, how long will you judge unjustly and accept persons of the wicked? And God encourages them, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. And so this is clearly a rebuke. And we're, we're going to, in, in a moment, we can touch on why, how, you know, how are they supposed to do these things? Like, where, what is, where do they have a chance to help the poor if you're an angel in heaven, right? So we'll get into that. But the, 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 what really brings it home contextually that we're talking about angels is when we get to verse six, and it says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. They're gods. Lord G gods, right? And so we, and we shouldn't be scared of this term as Christians that God acknowledges, right? right? God is called the Lord. Yahweh is called the God of gods in Old Testament. So it's acknowledging that there are lower G gods, the fallen angelic realm, the angelic realm that they, they are referred to as gods. Of course, they're not God in the common sense we think of. They're not the most high, El Elyon. But God would never need the title the most high if there weren't other beings who are high. And that's who this is, this divine council of the angelic realm. And it continues in verse 7, it says, but ye shall die like men. So it's making a clear contrast, right? It's saying you're going to die like a man, meaning you're not a man, but you're going to die like one. So it's telling us contextually that these are angelic beings that God is, re is rebuking. And I love verse 8 because this really, again, is almost giving us a clue in the mystery we're trying to uncover. It says, arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou talking about God. And right now, David, the psalmist, is moving back into his own voice and is saying, God, arise, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And that's a really important passage because, again, God created the earth. God rules the earth. So why would he have to inherit anything? Why would God inherit nations if he has them already? Because maybe He's given authority to them, to someone else. And this is what this is going back to. This is this is the context of why God is rebuking them is because what we're going to see is this divine counsel is mentioned earlier in Scripture, and God gave them authority over other nations, right? And this is found in Deuteronomy 32. Yes. And so Deuteronomy 32 is where we see God dividing the nations and, and it, it makes this reference to saying that when God divided the nations in the Masoretic text, it says he divided according to the number of the sons of Israel, right? But when you go to the Septuagint, and that reveals a lot of what's happening and makes it much more clear that this is a supernatural context. The super the, the Septuagint, which for those who don't know, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was written in roughly the second century BC. And it was uh, translated from Paleo Hebrew, from the original Hebrew alphabet, right? Where the Masoretic text is translated from the later Hebrew called squared or Masoretic Hebrews, the Masoretic Hebrew alphabet. So the Septuagint is really the closest thing we have to the original Old Testament that's written, the recorded written Old Testament. And there, when you read that passage in Deuteronomy 32, it says that God divided the nations according to the number of the angels in heaven, the angels of God, the sons of God, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a reference to angels. And why is that important? Well, well, what, what was happening there, right, is that it continues by saying that the Lord's portion is Jacob. Israel is God's portion. So God, at this time, at the division of nations, basically said, I'm going to turn over what we call the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, to these angels, right? You see in the table of nations, we see this table of 70 nations in scripture, and I'm going to reserve, I'm going to build my nation through one man, right? Which was originally Abraham, right? The father of the faith and build the nation of Israel. So God basically said, I'm, I'm setting the, the battlefield is basically my nation versus the rest of the world. And I've put these angels in charge of these of these nations. And so what we see, and we even see a further glimpse of this uh, in Daniel chapter 10. And I mentioned this in Judgment of the Nephilim as well, where you see this battle taking place. Daniel, of course, is praying for Israel and for the end of their captivity in Babylon for 21 days. And finally, the angel Gabriel comes to speak to him to 
It says, you know, from the day you prayed, I was sent forth to mm -hmm. answer you. But he says, but the, you know, but the prince of Persia withstood me. They were battling. And so he was battling a fallen angel who's called the prince of Persia. So we see clearly there is a fallen angel assigned. And I believe this is why we, in the New Testament, it calls them principalities. A principality is a reference to a location. They rule that angel ruled over Persia, which of course was the dominant empire at that time. And they were fighting. And that's why it took 21 days for the angel to reach Daniel. And then he says, Michael, the archangel, he said, your prince, meaning that Michael is the righteous angel who's the prince over signed over Israel, fought with this angel and helped Gabriel to escape. And now he said, now I can reach you because he helped me win the fight. And he said, when I leave, I'm going to go and fight the prince of Greece. Right. So amazing passage. It's not only is it showing this kind of heavenly warfare, but also the Greek Empire was not even born at this time. So it's also showing the power of God's prophecy that he that the angel already knows the next that Prince is going to go down and the next empire is going to have a different angel because it's going to be Greece, right? And so so this is this is the backdrop of everything that's taking place in Psalm 82. So we go back to Psalm 82, we can see this is what God is talking about, right? This is what God means here when he's saying, you know, you you dealt unjustly. You haven't helped the poor. How long you judge unrighteously? And it's interesting because when you go again to the Septuagint version of Psalm 82, it says, God stands in the assembly of gods. And in the midst of them will judge the gods. So it's not even calling them mighty. It's using the term gods. Again, Elohim. And it says, and, and then, um, so it's the way they have ruled the nations, right? To allow injustice, to allow wickedness, greed. This is why gods are being, this is why they can be, how could they be responsible for anything happening to the poor people on earth? Because they've been assigned over these nations and they're allowing wickedness to flourish. And this is why God can say, you have, you've allowed this to happen so God can rightly judge them because they are doing wickedness. They're, they're spreading wickedness in the earth. and. Um, and even then, when you think about it, too, you know, again, you know, we quote Ephesians 6, you know, 12 all the time. We wrestle not the flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Like, and, you, and we go through this list of angels, prince, you know, uh, um, rulers of darkness, right? It's talking about the angelic realm. But again, this contrast, right? Not flesh and blood. But it says wrestle. We res wrestling is close quarter contact right that's con that we're you don't wrestle somebody with a gun you're that means they're in your face putting their hands on you right and i i don't think we give that enough attention mm. that what the bible is saying is that these beings they're here and they want to wrestle you right <laughs> so it you know so it's like they're not just in thirty five thousand feet in the sky looking down and just watching things they're interacting Paul is telling us in that passage, this is your enemy, and they are here trying to battle you. And so when you put in that context of the unbelieving world, they can just run rampant with people who don't believe in God, right? If a demon can make someone act completely insane, certainly a fallen angel can do even more, right? And so, and so yeah, so, so when you put this all together, you know, it's really clear that these sons of God, these are angels, and God is giving us little glimpses to say, yeah, there's an organization in heaven. There's governance, right? Even in Job, where God has angels on his left and his right, right? God has says, and it says the sons of God came before God's throne and Satan was among them, right? They're gathering, they meet, they have order. They have, there are different, um, there are even issues that God presents to the fallen angels, right? You know, you see with uh, King Ahab, Right, the husband of Jezebel. They had they were running a satanic kingdom. Right, she had the priests of Baal in Israel. She was setting up te uh, temples all, all all over Jerusalem. This is one of the most idolatrous satanic king couples <laughs> in Israel's yes. history. And when when Ahab was going to die, right, God had determined it's it's, it's he's had enough. He wanted to have Ahab was going to go into battle, but was unsure if he was going to win. And God said, who will go down there? And an angel said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophet. So he said, I'm going to go down there. 
in, indwell or possess one of his prophets and say, yeah, you're going to win this battle, Ahab, knowing he's going to die. So you see, it's so it's really interesting that yeah. they are still there. You can have a fallen angel who's still listening to God, who's still carrying out God's plan. Because at the end of the day, if God gives a fallen angel a chance to hurt a, hurt a human, they're going to do it. Because Paul told us they hate us, right? That's why soon, even in Job, as soon as Satan had the chance to do anything to Job, he's like, I'm there. Right. So, so, so taking this all into account, this is, you know, this is, you know, again, what Dr. Michael Heiser calls that divine counsel, where there's an order and God will, is still interacting and allowing the devil and fallen angels to come before him and discuss issues and, and he's giving them command. So it's really, um, some issues are really fascinating passage because we, we only have a few chapters in the Bible that give us such a view yeah. into the angelic realm. Yeah. And that's what we find in uh, a lot of the Psalms is, you know, David is speaking through, you know, prophetic utterances. And so and a lot Absolutely. of times, obviously, you know, he even quotes some of the things that Jesus said, you know, that later on happened. And, uh, but I wanted to put that, I wanted to put that a little bit into perspective, what you said about Deuteronomy 32, because when, when you read Psalm 82, and you don't understand the divine counsel um, and what is happening in that spiritual realm and the supernatural realm before the presence of God um, with these sons of God, you know, uh, if you go back to, uh, you touched uh, quite a bit on Deuteronomy 32, I want to specifically, I want to read verses eight and nine from the ESV version. And the ESV version says, when the most high gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Yes. Verse nine, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage, which you touched on. But here, some translations have verse eight as sons or children of Israel, while yes. others have, like in the ESV, like you mentioned, like you mentioned. have the sons of God. Now, what is the link here between, you know, what is what what has happened in Deuteronomy 32, um, the link between Psalm 82? What is what's the link here with Genesis 11 and Nimrod and the Tower of Babel? Because yes, this, this is what this is right? it, right? So this is this is when so you, if you think about it, right? So Nimrod, of course, is the first kind of post diluvian emperor right so the first person is really building a kingdom of course the tower of babel we find here in which is described in detail right after the table of nations right that now god of course had told humanity fill the earth spread out and fill the earth and, and nimrod you know being a foreshadow really of antichrist said no we're going to have one nation one city one a language, world government. all the one world government, right? And one religion, right? Okay. Because, you know, I, I believe certainly the Tower of Babel wasn't just a tower, it was an attempt to almost like a temple, really, yeah. or like an like ancient version of CERN, right? Trying to open a portal to the yeah. spiritual realm. That's really what they were trying to do. And the, the easy confirmation of that is when God says, looks down from heaven and says, if they complete this, if they finish building this tower, there is nothing which they imagine to do which can be withheld from them. Right. And that is, to me, that is like a chilling statement from God. That God's saying, if they do this, there's, there's, they can do anything. That there's like unlimited power will be un yeah. unleashed. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, God had to come down from heaven and stop it himself. And this is, of course, where he's divided the nations, right? He's, he's scattered. He confused the languages to force people and spread them out by force 
to stop the, the Babel construction and then also cause the development of the, the various nations in the ancient world. And so this is when, so the context, again, is when he set the bounds of the nations. We see this in Deuteronomy 32. This re re referring to this time, because again, you see, this is right at the time we see the table of nations listed in, in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. And so that's the, really the whole through line through all of this. When did this happen? It's talking about the Tower of Babel dispersion which again, in the ancient world, this was really, um, this was one of the biggest really assaults on the heavenly realm. This is a huge event in the biblical, in ancient biblical history, right? I mean, they said, even what they said, their aspiration said, let us make a name, Shem, right? Uh, you know, God, a name for God is Hashem, the name. So the idea of making a name for ourselves was again, I believe, trying to achieve divine power. I think what they really want to do is to bring back the days of Noah, bring back the sons of God, bring them back to earth. We want it, it open, openly, right? We want them to rule over us, we want them to bring back the Nephilim, all these things. And so it was really um, a very dangerous time could have been unleashed in the earth again. And so, and if you think about like how many times, in, there are only a handful of times that God will come down personally to deal with humanity and this is one and so yeah so it was really and and so and so i think as a result of that god said okay you know there's there's always kind of a give and take and this is true in 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 our lives whether you're a christian or non-believer you know many times god will give you what you want in sin Right when the people of Israel had their first king, they said, "Give us a king so we can be like all the other nations." Right? They wanted to be like the rest of the world, even though God had said, "You're my inheritance. I don't want them." They said, "No, we want to be like them." And so God's like, "Okay, I'll give you a king since you want one." And, he, and even though Samuel told them he's going to be terrible, you're, you're going to hate this guy. <laughs> he's going to take your wealth. He's going to take your children. And they said, nevertheless. Bring them on, right? And so here they go, right? They, they're they trying to get the fallen angels. So God says, okay, now I'm going to divide you and these fallen angels you were, were, were pining for and longing for. And now they're going to be an authority over all your individual nations. And you're going to be shut off from my word. So I'm going to consolidate my word in one person and build my own nation. And now, and, and that's where I will be. And now you can have this world of fallen angelic dominion that you've been trying so hard to get but of course it's not what you really want in the end right and that's 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 the devil's trick all the time right right since adam and eve he's been promising things and when you get it it's never what you thought it was going to be right yeah. and so that again babel is really the ground zero of this divine council and this arrangement among the nations we find a, a parallel passage to that in deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19 and this is another interesting passage where God says he's warning against idolatry and saying, don't worship the stars, right? So again, going talking about like, you know, angels are often referred to as stars. He says, don't, you know, where you see it's the sun, the moon, the stars. And he says, even all the host of heaven. So it's clear we're talking about angels and God's saying, don't worship them. He says, should you be driven to serve them, worship them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So again, God is saying, don't worship those angels, the same angels who I've divided the nations of this world according to them. Yeah. So it's another passage that confirms this arrangement in the divine council. Wow. So then what, what ends up happening is that Psalm... 82 is a reference to the result of what ended up happening in that that is discussed from the whole tower of babel deuteronomy 32 exactly exactly see it all begins to make sense it's the connecting of the dots we were talking about it the other day with sharon derek and sharon gilbert it's when you begin to connect the dots is when the picture begins to to form absolutely I love that. I love that. I, I I would love to stay a little longer on um, the Tower of Babel and what happened with all of these nations, but I want to switch gears on you for a moment. You might all get right. a, little, a little deep here. All right. <laughs> so 
it's my understanding when I did a little bit of research on this, my understanding that a uh, divinity professor by the name of Thomas Chalmers, have you ever heard of him? I have. From the University of, I'm going to say this correctly because I recently went to Scotland and it's okay. not Edinburgh. That is incorrect, I understand. All right. And they don't. They don't take it very lightly if you say it wrong. <laughs> so it's, if you want to say it just like a Scot, you would say Edinburgh. Edinburgh. All right. Edinburgh. Edinburgh. <laughs> Almost like Edinburgh. Just all of Edinburgh. So yeah. there's, my, there's my showing off my, my Scot. I like it. I like it. I, like, I didn't know that. I like it. But I'm not surprised. And the only reason why I say that is because I've never been to Scotland, mm -hmm. but I can't remember there was a, a you know, um, I can't remember. There was a film. This is like probably twenty something years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was like a heist film that had Brad Pitt, where he only spoke in like a Scottish brogue, and you could. It was very difficult to understand. Oh, him. serious? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the whole film, that's how he spoke. Was, I don't remember really cool. that movie actually. Yeah, I can't remember the name, but it was, it was like a heist, you know, kind of one of those heist films. Right. So, um, right. Yeah. So he he does know. a really good job. It's very convincing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so there you go. So not Edinburgh, but it's Edinburgh. 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 Okay. So Thomas Chalmers, right? So yes. he was a professor there and he introduced the gap theory. Okay. And, uh, and, and the reason he did that, it was to explain what some called a contradiction between science and the Bible with regards to how old the earth is. And, you know, there's all yeah. this, you know, supposed contradiction right of how old is the earth well how old is the universe how you know you you have scientists who will uh, discuss you know billions and billions of of years and sure. so for the sake of our audience yeah. can you explain what the gap theory is and what are your thoughts on that yeah sure absolutely so so chalmers um so of course he lived and worked and wrote uh, in the 19th century and preached right and, as well and so he actually he um so just to set the context the time frame of this right because this is all because because he's often connected to charles darwin and of course the origin of the species um the book that launched the whole evolutionary movement and i'm not i don't believe in evolution i'm not ascribed to evolution i'm not a darwinian believer um it's also an incredibly racist book right and that's really the, the full title says in the superiority right of i think the Caucasian race right the, it's, the actual original title is actually clearly a, a white supremacist title wow. and so i don't agree with him i don't and i don't i'm not an evolutionist just to make that clear um however that book was published the origin species was published in 1859 and by that time chalmers had been um giving speeches and presentations on the gap theory uh for a decade by the time the book came out and then wrote on it afterwards and so what the gap theory in the simplest way to explain it is what it says is that essentially when you look at genesis chapter one in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and of course you get to verse two and the earth became formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the face of the waters of the deep. And so in between those verses, the gap theory says, well, wait a second. When God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning, that is an unspecified time. There is no date given with that, that at some point in antiquity, God created the heaven and the earth. And then when we get to verse two and we see the earth is formless and void and darkness is formed upon the waters of the deep, uh, that this is the, that the earth had been judged and that darkness and the water is all a result of a judgment of God, God punishing the inhabitants of the earth. And that's why it's in that, ver that form. And in between verses one and two is when all that happened, right? Well, what because of course it begs the question, well, why would God judge the earth if he had just created it? Well, the gap there says no, there was an ancient history that predates Adam and Eve mm -hmm. on the earth. And that this is the time where God unleashed a judgment that leads to the earth being in this ruins. It's also called the ruin and restoration theory. That's what it was called really in the 19th century. And that the earth was in this ruined condition in Genesis chapter one as a result of this judgment on the ancient world before Adam. 
And so, which leads to getting even more questions. Well, who was there if Adam wasn't there? Who was there? And again, this goes back to the angels, that the angels were on earth before Adam. And it was their rebellion, of course, not all of them, right? The one third who rebelled with Satan that led to it being judged. And so when we get to the creation week in Genesis 1, and we see the six creation days, those are literal 24-hour days. It says the evening and the morning was the first day. So it's not, it's, I don't believe in each day was a thousand years, or it's just a metaphor. These are six 24-hour days, of course, the seventh days when God rested. But what's taking place in those days is a restoration. God is restoring the earth back to being full of life, right? And so that's and so that's how we get to creation week. So and so when we think about people say many people say, well, the earth is six thousand years old because you look at the biblical, approximately because the biblical history there's obviously very detailed genealogies in the Bible that gets you to about six thousand years when you count to today. And what I would say to that is humanity is 6,000 years old. That I absolutely believe, right? Adam was created approximately 6,000 years ago. And however, we don't, the Bible does not say when the earth itself was created. And the gap theory says that, and that's the gap theory. That's the, the high level explanation of what the gap theory is saying, that there was this, this history uh, that involves the fallen angels on earth before Adam. So not necessarily um, a, well, a pre-Adamic race, but not necessarily human beings. These are angelic No, beings. not humans. No, I, I do not believe there were any, I believe Adam was the first human, right? And God says, you know, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. And, I, and so, the, so clearly, again, if you look at some of the language too, it's kind of giving hints that something was happening before. Because even the way God says about man, let's make man in our image, it's almost implying that like maybe something went wrong with the beings who weren't made in God's image. Mm. It's like this time we're going to make the creation in our image, in our likeness. Like we're we're going right to the source of us to make this creation of humanity. And so, and I think it's a it, it's it's almost like alluding to the fall of the angels and the, and, and and so when you start when you start thinking about it from that perspective i've i've had many discussions about this it's like okay just think about it when you see everything in the creation week the angels aren't even mentioned mm -hmm. so where when were they created what day were they created because they're not even mentioned and so that alone is like well that's a mysterious right and and then you look at some of the language about the different creatures, right? It says, you know, the beasts were created after their kind. Well, what if they're brand new, there is no kind, right? If God made a cow and this is the first cow, how could it be after a kind? There's nothing for it to be modeled off of. It's the first of the, of its kind. But yet we see this type of language and even um the idea that the earth was formless and void, mm -hmm. right? This tohu vabohu, uh, uh, tohu vabohu in Hebrew. And, and the verb haya for to be, right? The verb to be in Hebrew is very different from how it is in English. In English, we use the verb to be constantly. I'm at the store. I was in high school. I do, I, I am going here. I will do this. You know, it's like we use it all the time. However, in Hebrew, they don't really use the verb to be in that same sense that we use it in English. And so if you say, for example, I was a quarterback in high school, in Hebrew, that's really I quarterback in high school. Mm -hmm. And it's implied that you're taking something, that it's going back in time, that you were that thing. So when you see the actual verb to be being used, haya, in Hebrew, it usually denotes a transition actual something changing and so chalmers was one of the, one of the first really christians in to write and say this really means the earth became formless and void that not that it was originally created at covered in water surrounded by darkness over the face of the deep the te home right and when you think about that the te home right the deep the abyss why was there even an abyss if the earth was just created if no one there's no evil in the world why would god even create an abyss mm -hmm. To begin with, 
But Chalmers said, no, what happens is the earth is, it came that way. It was created beautifully. And then because God judged the earth, it became that way. And what I point to, of course, being someone who's very interested and a passionate researcher of the days of Noah, just look at the parallels between Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter eight. You again, you find the earth is judged. It's covered in water, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, you know, you have Adam is created and his first task is to name the animals. The animals come to him and he's just naming them in the Garden of Eden. You have Noah, who's the father of, of redeemed humanity, the last remnant of humanity, right? He's a type of Adam. He's now restarting the human race. And what does God say? I'm going to bring all the animals to you, just like the animals came to Adam. And you're, they're all going to get on your ark. You have a sin involving fruit, right? There's a fruit in the garden you cannot eat. And of course, Adam and Eve partake of the fruit. Well, what happens to Noah? He starts drinking the fruit of the vine and gets drunk, mm. right? There's lots of parallels between mm. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Eight. And so what I submit is that that God, and we, we see God saying, I'm never going to do this again. He says, I'm never flooding the world again. And so again, I think that, um, that, that the reason why the earth was covered in water in, in verse two is because it was judged. And then there's also an interesting passage uh, in Isaiah chapter 45, where Isaiah is proclaimed that God, you know, God's greatness and specifically references the creation of the earth and says he did not create it in vain. And that term there is tohu va bohu. The exact same term from Genesis 1 verse 2, which says formless and void, is used in Isaiah 45, 18. And, and Isaiah says God did not create it in vain. He created it to be, he formed it to be inhabited. So it's telling when God made the earth, it was not in this ruined judge state. It was inhabited. It was made to be inhabited by life, right? right. Which makes sense, right? That's why, you know, that God would make something, the earth in a pristine, beautiful state. And so, um, so that's a, to me, again, another one of these clues that wait, there's something else going on here that's indicating that this judgment took place. And then, uh, you know, again, going back to the angelic realm, we can look at some of the examples uh, of what of of I think giving hints to this ancient era. Well, what happened in this ancient era? How do we know there's some ancient era with angels on earth before humans? Well, I think we see this in Ezekiel 28, right? And in, in, in Judgment of the Nephilim, I call this an esoteric passage where God is speaking to a king or a prince in word. He, address, he uses their name and their title, but he's really addressing a fallen angel, an angelic being. And in Ezekiel 28, he, I believe he's clearly addressing Satan, and he's recounting when Satan was righteous, mm -hmm. and he's and before his fall. And he okay. says, that was perfect in all thy ways. You sealed up the sum, full of wisdom and beauty. So it's praising him. Yeah. And then it gives us amazing verse where it says thou hast been in eden the garden of god satan was in the garden of eden yeah but was it when he was the serpent the nakash no this is before that ever happened because it says every precious stone was thy covering and then it lists nine stones in the masoretic version says the sardius the topaz the onyx the carbuncle right and it's those stones are all stones that aaron the first high priest, the brother of Moses, had to wear on his breastplate, which I see on your bookshelf behind you. It looks, looks like you have it there on the That's bookshelf. That's right. That he had to wear. I was going to say my ring, go, too, but no. Uh, oh, oh, very nice. I have a ring. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. But, of course, he had to wear those stones, that, you know, uh, to go into the most holy place in the tabernacle. And so God's saying that Satan wore this breastplate. So clearly this is Satan. And it says, that was perfect in all thy ways until iniquity was found in me. So it's telling us this is what Satan was doing before he ever sinned. And he was in Eden. So when was this? This is clearly because we know when Adam and Eve are created, when he shows up, he's already bad. He's already the devil. 
That's what no I No doubt about it. He's evil. Now, right. So that means this is clearly talking about an era before Adam was ever there and Satan was in Eden, in the garden. And this is what I believe is taking place in that gap between Genesis 1 and verse 2 that led to the, the ruin or judgment of the flood on the earth. First yeah, flood. Isn't there, yeah, isn't, that's what I was going to say, isn't there uh, a reference to what is called Satan's flood? Exactly, right? exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and not I, that I he, that, that he, go ahead, but he, he, it's not he created the flood, it's that there was a, there was a, a destruction that occurred because of the sin, yes? Exactly, yes, yes, that this, and I believe that judgment is, was the, the flood of the earth, that the, the, the original flood that we see in Genesis 1-2 was against Satan for his rebellion, of course, before humanity was created, so yeah, I agree with that, and I think, you know, um, I think that it's actually even referenced Satan's flood in the New Testament, and so, you know, you when you talk about the Bible being complex. This is a very complex passage. And this is in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses okay. 5 to 7. And this is an amazing passage. Uh, and it says, you know, this is, and this, listen to how Peter says this. All right, I'm going to turn For it. this, they willingly are ignorant of, right? It's a very interesting way to start this. He's saying that there are certain people who out of the who are intentionally ignorant of this and it says that by the word of god the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved into fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men so many people Read, read that and their automatic thought is oh yeah sure the earth was flooded with water in noah's flood but is that what this passage is saying and i would submit that no it's not you know and it's interesting because first of all who is ignorant of the flood of noah i mean that is something where that's one of literally one of the most popular stories in the history in, in human history i mean people who've never touched a bible in their life know about noah's ark yeah. It's everyone. It's it's literally one of the most well known stories of any kind in the entire history of the world, and certainly in the time of Peter, <laughs> his life on Earth, there is no one ignorant of the flood of Noah. Right? It's a well known. It's one of the biggest events in, of antiquity. Yeah. So I don't think that's what he's talking about. And also the way he describes it, the Earth standing out of water and in, and it says, and he says, by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And so, so it's kind of taking us to a different time. And it's because then he contrasts that by saying the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, and I believe that's talking about the heaven and the earth to which we live in, in Adam, the age of humanity. And so I think that is uh, what Peter's actually alluding to is this, the flood, the, the Satan's flood, as you called it. Uh, rather than the flood of Noah. Yeah. Let me read it in the ESV uh, yeah, sure. uh, version. It says, for they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was delu deluged, right? with yes. water and perished but by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction for the of the ungodly that is eye opening yeah exactly and you think about um the different world the idea of world and earth right they really have different meanings right the world yes. oftentimes in the new testament greek it refers to an era an mm -hmm. age as opposed to the earth, which is the physical planet. And so I think, again, Peter's really saying that there was an ancient age that has perished. It's gone. The, the days of Satan running around Eden and the angels being on earth, like now we're in the age, the world we are in now is we're humans, right? We have dominion over the earth, right? We're on earth now. And so, um, so I think that's what he's alluding to. I think that's what he's actually referring to, uh, 
And again, if you think about where he says, even in the ESV language, right? If you think about what God is doing in the creation week, right? The world, the earth is coming out of this water, right? The Holy Spirit's coming, is hovering, right? And by the way, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters of the deep, right? Yes. Remember what Noah did to get out of the ark. He let a dove fly over the water, right? And the Holy Spirit takes the form of a dove. So again, you see the parallels between the, oh. the first flood and the second flood. It right. specifically says the Spirit's hovering and Noah sends a dove to hover over the water to let him know he gets safe to come out and restart the earth again. Right. And that's what we see. The Holy Spirit comes and all of a sudden the earth is, re is restarting again. Right. So it's coming out of a judgment. And I even I even think of. Genesis chapter one, I really think of it as the gospel. Hmm. We are the earth in Genesis one, two. That's who we are. We are ruined by sin. Wow. That's exactly how we were born. Right. Jesus, David said, right. In Psalm 51, he was shaping in, he was in, in iniquity, formed like he had sin in the womb, right? And what happens to us? The Holy Spirit comes of God. And then what do we receive? Light. We receive the light of Christ. God said, let there be light. The Spirit comes. We believe. And now, now we can see. That's beautiful. Now the light of God. To... So I, I see it. God is giving a picture of our own salvation right in the opening chapter of the Bible. That is beautiful. And we grow Right, then we grow as a Christian. We keep, and get all of a sudden we have flowers and buds, and now we're blooming. Right, and that's what happens to the earth. Right, and that's the gospel. So, that is absolutely beautiful. Do you think that Adam yeah. had? Um, I don't know what other phrase to describe it, other than special abilities, unlike what we have because we're fallen now. Prior to the fall. I mean, think yeah. about it. He had to name, he, he, he named all of the animals. Um, and it, if he named all the animals, did he not name all of the fish? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. Right. Right. So, so how, how would he do that? That's a very good question. Yeah. So, you know, again, remember, I, I, you know, the world of Adam and Eve's day, is the the world without the veil right so the supernatural is intersecting yes. with the net the human realm openly right god is talking to adam and eve satan's walking around talking to them too he's you know he's just yeah so there's also so to me to say that adam had supernatural powers wouldn't be a stretch at all because they were living in the supernatural realm at that time right garden the garden of eden is what i call the first temple that's where yeah. God chose to put his presence in that garden and created it. Remember, the Garden of Eden, there are few, only a few things in scripture that are designed and created by God. The Garden of Eden, with God, God made that garden. So it itself was supernatural, right? There's a tree that if you eat from the fruit, you live forever, right? That's a superpower, right? That you can eat and you just never die. Mm -hmm. So, and even, I haven't talked about, I even believe that Adam and Eve emitted light. Divine, I believe that they could that they could glow. And so I think that also played a role in them knowing that they were naked because their light went out. And why would I say that? Because they were in the presence of God so true. for a long, we don't even know how long. Moses spent 40 days with God, right? And his face was glowing to the point that his own friends and family wouldn't look at him. They were scared of him because he was glowing and emitting this light because he was reflecting the light of God. And so I believe that when they sin, that light went out, and that's when and that's when they had said, "Well, we got to get some leaves and try and you know fig leaves and cover ourselves up because that light was gone." Wow, what a great point! That's a great, great point. And and if if uh, if we look at the the rest of the story, that you know God Himself um, sacrificed the or the very first sacrifice was there in Genesis as well to cover up. Absolutely, you know. Adam yeah, another a, a net clear that. picture of the gospel, right? There, a Fair death had. To it had to take place to cover their sin to atone exactly. right it was atonement for their sin exactly. yeah exactly whoever said the bible was boring <laughs> i didn't know what they're talking about <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about absolutely not 
you know, for, for um, the month of July, our series is entitled Supernatural. Great title. So, uh, it's very appropriate what we're talking about. And um, and like we, we've been discussing over and over again of how many supernatural events uh, we see and we read in the Bible. And I think that if we fast forward now and look towards the end of the book and the book of Revelation, um, it's, you know, I mean, there's so many Im uh, imageries uh, there of the supernatural. Uh, we see so many supernatural beings. And um, I think that if if we read, because I've read the, the book of Revelation several times. Um, I've, I've done a studies too on the seven churches in the book of Revelation and whatnot. I know you're very involved in uh, giving um, teachings on Revelation as well. When you uh, have your Thursday night theologies and you've had your little uh, snippets of your videos and things. Um, I, and I, I do enjoy those so much. So I wanted to pick your brain for just the next few moments, if you don't mind on that. But when we look at the scene begins to shift in chapter four, right? Of the book of Revelation, because we're, yes. we saw, obviously we see John describing, you know, uh, the vision of Jesus, which is absolutely spectacular. Um, and there's so much in that. It's not just, oh, look what I see. I, you know, Jesus is, has his feet of bronze and he's got, you know, it's, there's so much in that. There's so much imagery in there, um, that it's beautiful. But, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about chapter four, when we, when it shifts into chapter four, John sees a door right? A door standing open in heaven and a voice like the sound of a trumpet telling him to come up here. And I will show you what must take place after these things. So John obviously witnesses some of the most spectacular scenes depicted in the Bible. This yes. sounds to me, right? Like John saw a portal into heaven. And I want you to kind of like set the scene for us here, right? So I will show you what must take place after these things. Does that phrase in chapter four, one mean after the messages to the seven churches in Revelation two and three? Uh, it is, is Revelation in chronological order? What do you, what do you say about all that? Great question. Yes. So the answer to the, to the last question is yes. I absolutely believe Okay. That revelation is in chronological order. And I think that's critical to understand revelation, to understand any of it, right? So, okay. and also I believe that not only is it in chronological order, this that the the seals, the trumpets, and the vial or bold judgments of revelation are also in sequence. Now, don't get me wrong, there are certain chapters that kind of zoom in or are parathetical that are kind of summing up events. And there are several of those throughout, but generally it's mm -hmm. in chronological order. So first of all, we can see right from the start, right? You already read the verse in verse yeah. one of chapter four. It says after this, yeah. it's already telling us the sequence, right? And then once you get to chapter five, every single chapter begins with the word and for the rest of the book. Okay. So it's an and. So again, it's telling you this is the, in, and it's giving us sequence, yeah. right? Yeah. It's almost like a kid, right? Yeah. Mommy, I went to school and I saw my friend and then we went to the mall <laughs> and then we've got ice cream and then, and then, right. So it's yeah. giving us that sequence. Right. And so, so yeah, so I think when you look at the, the, the letters in uh, to the seven churches, you know, they're amazing, I, but I think in, in time it's to those churches that were addressed, right. Ephesus, Philadelphia, all of them, Laodicea. However, they speak to different epochs of the church, I think, through time as well, right? Yeah. It's, 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 you know, and, and this is, of course, you know, I talk about this extensively in the final Nephilim, that God exists outside of time. So he's literally addressing past, present, and future at the same time in these letters. Mm -hmm. And I, But however, what I find really fascinating in the letters, and I think sets the stage for chapter four, is that in the letter, in all the letters to the churches, all seven letters, right? There's different, some are praised, some are rebuked. Every promise to those churches is connected to the Great Tribulation. It's somehow connected to the end times. 
I mean, he even says, I will cast you in a, into the great tribulation, into a bet, right? So it's Jesus specifically saying, if you do this, if you stay faithful, you'll receive this in the great tribulation, right? Or if you're not, you're going to be punished, right? And you'll you will suffer that hour of temptation that trieth the whole earth, right? That is a specific reference to the great tribulation that God, Jesus is warning this church to repent. And so given that context, it says, now I'm going to show you what's going to take place. So send these letters to the churches so they can stay faithful until that hour. And so I believe now in chapter four, Jesus said, now I'm going to tell you about this hour of temptation. Mm -hmm. Right. That this is you want to know what's going to happen in this hour of temptation. Another name for the great tribulation. Right. Is that hour of temptation. Right. And I think even, you know, this is something, too, that because I'm a pre-tribulation rapture believer, mm -hmm. I believe even the Lord's prayer. Mm -hmm. when it says lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's not saying. Jesus, please don't lead me into sin. We don't have to pray to God. God is not leading us into any sin. So we don't have to, it's, I believe it's what it's saying is do not keep us here for the great tribulation. Deliver us Deliver from us. the evil one because mm -hmm. that's his hour, right? It's just like when Jesus was about to be crucified, he says, this is your hour. The great tribulation is, is Satan's last hour. Yeah. So even in that, that so, so now in chapter four, this is that hour of temptation. So Jesus said, I'm going to show you the end times. And I do believe, yes, that he's, it's a portal. He's going through a portal. And it also mirrors the rapture, right? It says like, yeah. right, it's the, the voice of a trumpet, right? I'm at the last that, yeah. trump, right? It says the, at the last trump, but the voice of the archangel, he hears a voice that sounds like a trump. We're seeing all these allusions to the rapture here, right? So yes, yeah, so I believe it is a portal that is taking him, of course, before the throne of God. But as you said, that's absolutely beautiful and there god clearly is going to share and give the, the greatest description of the future we're going to see when he describes in, in detail yeah. the judgments of the seals of, uh trumpets and bowls yeah it, and if if in fact the Revo the book of revelation is in chronological order then the the seven churches are mentioned prior to the come up here you know exactly right so exactly so the last that. one being laodicea <laughs> uh, exactly yeah. the last one being <laughs> the lukewarm <laughs> church uh, let's see yeah. hmm, does that sound familiar <laughs> <laughs> oh lord unfortunately right who who yeah. do you who do you think the 24 elders that john sees are uh great question great question um so I think the 24 elders um, are angels. I believe that they're elder among the angelic realm, just like you have principalities, powers, sons of God, dominions, right? Thrones, they're referred to as well in the New Testament. And I believe that's who these angels are. Paul specifically says there are certain angels called thrones, right? And here we see these angels are sitting in thrones, around God's bigger throne, right? Okay. And what I look to, I, you know, I love typology, right? Yes. I believe everything, all the things we're seeing in Revelation, they have a precursor, a type, a similitude in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And so we see in multiple times, right, this, this number, uh, the significance of, you know, this number 24, and specifically with the, the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. Okay. They were divided, right? So if you, for the priests, uh, the Levitical priests who worked in the temple, they didn't work all year round. Mm -hmm. their, their, their work was divided throughout the year in 24 divisions, and they called them 24 courses, right? And we see this with uh, John the Baptist, that his father, when he was a baby, when the, when the, when the angel came and told him, Gabriel came and said, your wife's going to have a baby. And he said, no, we're too old. And he made him mute until the baby was born. It says he was a priest. He was working in the temple. It says of the courts of Abia. And so that was the name, the Hebrew name, of one of the his shift, essentially. And so, again, I believe what was taking place, God is giving us a picture on earth, right? Everything in the tabernacle and the temple is a picture of heaven. How do we know that? 
God specifically told Moses, mm -hmm. build it after what you saw in heaven. So he's wow. everything. It's just a reflection, right? And I, and that's the amazing thing when you think about the spiritual realm. We are in the human realm. We're like the shadow, right? If you think about how we are in 3D, your shadow is 2D, right? It's you, obviously, right? You can wave your hand. It's you, but it's you in two dimensions, whereas mm -hmm. you're you're you exist in three. Mm -hmm. In the spirit realm, it's the fourth dimension. We are the shadow. So the, the, that, that's how we are to the spirit realm. So it's more real. Like, like you are more real than your shadow. This God's heavenly realm is more real than this realm. So imagine that, right? Because we're their shadow. And so, so I think the 24 courses of the priesthood is a, is a type, a mirror of the 24 elders in heaven. And if you even think, again, going back to Moses, what did God say? He told him, appoint elders. Like, you need help. You know, he wouldn't want Moses working alone. So I think, again, it's that typology that we're seeing. I don't think, because I know many people say, oh, it's the disciples or the 12 patriarchs. Yeah. But I, but, and which, which I understand. And that makes sense. Cause again, you have 12 and 12 makes 24. That's right. not a coincidence. Sure. Right. And so, but again, I think that's all, again, just showing a reflection of the heavenly. The reason why there's 12 and 12 is because they are, reflecting what god already has in heaven right and remember there we see in revelation that there is a temple in heaven yes there's an altar there's incense right so all this is going on and so i would have to believe that temple is older than the temple of solomon yes. which means the elders were around <laughs> before the elders that That's moses true. had before the tabernacle I, we're, moses saw it right already and modeled it but well, for what he saw, which means they already they were already there. Of course, they were already there. They're older. They're all older than Moses, and so so that's how I land on that question, which is a very tricky question. But that I think the biblical evidence supports that it's God is showing us. If you want to know why there are twenty four courses on earth, this is why. Mm. This is what Moses saw that he's patterned uh, in ancient times. Wow, great, great answer. Absolutely. Okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. I as we, as we uh, kind of wrap it up in just a little bit, not just yet. I have more <laughs> picking to do for just okay. a few more moments. <laughs> okay. Okay, so chapter six of the book of Revelation yes. talks about six seals and four horsemen. And obviously we know of so many books that have been written, even movies or whatever <laughs> yeah. that have been talked about, the, uh, the four horsemen. The seventh seal is in chapter eight because there's an interlude in chapter seven. Mm -hmm. So what's happening here? Can you set the stage here with the horsemen? Yeah, absolutely. The yeah. So, with, so, so set the stage with the horsemen? Yes. Yeah, sure. So the horsemen, you know, it's really, um, you know, very interesting, right? So, so of course, the seal is open, and I believe, you know, uh, when we get to Revelation chapter 5, I have a very kind of more unique interpretation of the, the timing of these events, right? Because, again, I, I believe that what John is seeing is happening, right, right, during that time. And so before we get to 6 in chapter 5, right, he sees that they, you know, uh, God— the father is sitting on his throne with the seven sealed scroll. Okay. And it says no man was found worthy to open the scroll in heaven, in earth, or under the earth. Right. So saying there's no one in any realm who's worthy. Right. And John wants to cry and says, but then the angel says, you know, you know, don't try. You know, the lamb of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. The lamb's prevailed. And it says, yeah. and lo and behold. Which in the Greek, that term is like, whoa, out of nowhere. Meaning like literally out of nowhere, poof, there appeared the lamb as it were slain. And of course we know this is Jesus, right? Obviously this is Jesus. But I believe what John was seeing at that point, because remember the angel said just a moment earlier in the, in the text, the angel says, no one is worthy. Meaning nobody was found worthy. But now, the lamb has prevailed and he is worthy, of course, to take the scroll and open it. And so what I think is happening is this is right before the resurrection. 
That's why no one's worthy because Jesus had not yet been resurrected. But now he's won his victory, of course, on the cross. He resurrected three days later. And I believe what he sees in the Lamb appears is Jesus now ascending to heaven 50 days later, what we see in Acts chapter 1. I believe that is the moment Jesus has returned to heaven in a cloud. And now, of course, he's, he's worthy to open the scroll, obviously, our Lord. And, I, and he opens it. So I believe that scroll was opened at that time. Because it says, and he opened the scroll. So I believe, so I believe that uh, when we get to chapter six now, and the first seal is broken, when we see, of course, the four horsemen, that that can, that from a timing standpoint, that was 2,000 years ago when that was opened, 96 AD, which is when I put the writing of the book of Revelation. And so then, of course, who are these horsemen? What is happening here? Well, well uh, I, I believe the first, these four, the, the all four of them, I believe these are spirits. These are spirit realm beings, angelic beings. And why do I think that? Because again, letting scripture interpret scripture, mm -hmm. the only other place we see beings like this are in the book of Zechariah. You can see Zechariah chapter two, Zechariah chapter four, you see these angelic horses. These are not regular guys on horses. These are angels. And, and God specifically says that these are the spirits sent forth across the face of the whole earth. So he says these are spirits. So I believe these are spirit realm beings mm -hmm. that, of course, are ushering in different judgments on the earth, right? And they're obviously, the, the, the rider on the white horse is, I believe, bringing a spirit of apostasy, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. spiritual deception, right? Then you have the red horse rider brings its war, the black horse rider famine plague, pestilence, and then the fourth rider is death, the pale horse. And so where can we see confirmation of this? And I believe we find a specific confirmation of this in Matthew 24. Right. And so if you go to Matthew 24, where of course Jesus is describing in detail the end times, isn't it interesting, right? So, you know, we have the context, and I love this because the disciples say, when are these things going to take place? Right. Tell us, when shall these things be? And the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. So there's no question where we're talking about. They said, what's going to happen? When is the sign? When is the end of the world? And Jesus says, take heed that no man deceive you. The first sign that Jesus points to is deception. And I believe that is the spirit that the first, the white horse brings into the world, the spirit of deception. And what does it say? For many shall come in my name saying i am christ and shall deceive many okay we have spiritual deception and what's the second thing jesus says and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars so again what's the second rider the red horse it says it brings war so jesus is going in the exact order of revelation chapter six and then notice says afterwards says see that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet so there's going to be these wars prophetically, the wars that have been prophesied that will take place, but it's actually not the end times. So again, this is why I believe these seals were opened at the time John was alive. These spirits are being released into the earth, but it's not the Great Tribulation. It's not the end. Uh, all and four. Of course, all four, yes. All, all four. four. And this is for nations to rise against nation. Obviously, this is talking about war, kingdom against kingdom. And then it says, and there shall be famines and pestilence. The third rider, famine, right? That's what is that's what it's ushering in. That's that's you know, there's there's a, a, a clearly there's a food shortage, right? So that's what we're talking about. And pestilence, right? All the things that we see in the third rider. And let me go back to that. Let me go specifically to it, right? So it says, uh at the third horse, the third seal, it says, I love this because it says a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. So right. basically, you know, like a week's wages just to get a piece of bread. So, right. So, and so, so clearly there's, there's going to be famine, right? That people right. cannot afford food. And um, then we see the fourth seal and it's death. And it says, and hell followed powers given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the and with the beasts of the earth. And what does it say right after the famine? It says, 
and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. So there's going to be mass death, right? Pestilence, we've seen this, of course. The Black Plague, bubonic plague, these are things that are wiping out huge portions of the human race, right? And so it's death. And then Jesus says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So the sorrows, of course, is referring to the birth pangs, that things are just getting started. We're not at the birth yet. It's not time to go to the hospital yet. You're just getting a little, a little feeling, but it's not time yet, right? That's so, again, Jesus is saying these things are going to happen before the Great Tribulation. So do, so you, so you, do you think it's, you think it's going to, there's going to be a repeat though at the great tribulation of what these horsemen are doing? No, no. I think these, I think these spirits have been released on the earth during the, during the church age, the age we're in now, which by the way, is a gap in the Bible, right? Because we go from Jesus going to heaven, the book of Acts, right? Yeah. And the apostle Paul and his ministry. And then we jump to revelation. So there's a huge gap in the bible but that we're living in we're living in a gap right now right, the church, think about, age. right? There's no, the church age is a gap right we should could we jump from the first century church to revelation and then we're done to the end of the world okay. so we're living in a gap right now you talk about the gap theory and so so i believe these spirits are in the earth right now in the church age right and so which leads to well what about the fifth seal why is it open what's happening and I think that's the key thing is uh, the fifth seal is the only seal that is connected to time. Because hmm. when the fifth seal is opened, we see that these are martyrs, right? It says the fifth seal is opened. And I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. This has to be martyrs. These are people who are dying. For their faith and testimony of faith in God, in Christ. Right. right. So these are martyrs. And I believe these are martyrs who are being killed throughout the church age. And look what they say. They cry with a loud voice and saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So remember, the first four seals are open. And they're like, God, when are you going to judge the earth? So they they know that that's not the great tribulation because they're like they're still like waiting. They're saying, How long, God? We're waiting for the real judgment to start. So you can see the first four seals are not the great tribulation. They say, How long? And look at God's response, right? And they say to avenge us. They're like, We want our blood avenged. And look at God says, says, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled mm -hmm. and this is a verse that that is not discussed often at all because there's so much in there look, look at what god is saying he is telling them not yet it's not going to happen yet but that there's a number a number that right. the, there's a certain number of Christians who have to be killed, that number has to be fulfilled first, wow. right? I call this the last martyr, that God has a number. And if you think about it, God does that all the time, right? Think about when he's off to Abraham. He said, the sin of the Amorites, he said, in the fourth generation, I'm going to come back to them because they haven't reached my limit yet. I'm yeah. giving them a little, right? Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, their sins have reached up to heaven. So that God has certain thresholds that when you <laughs> reach it, then he's coming. Yeah. And so he, so God has a number and he says, it's very specific. He says, your fellow servants who, who should be killed. I mean, there's a certain, not because obviously not every Christian is going to be martyred, but he knows the ones who are going to be martyred. And when he reaches, when they reach that number, then, then I'm going to avenge you. So I believe we're living in the era of the fifth seal. And we don't know who that last martyr is. We don't know what that number right. is, but God knows. And when that number happens, that is when the great tribulation begins. And I believe that is when we are raptured. And I that all happens at the sixth seal. So, so you're, but you're saying then that we're going to go through some tribulation because obviously the tribulation period is a seven year tribulation. It's a three and a half. And then the latter part is the great tribulation, which is right. The, I don't the, believe we're here for any of it. I believe okay. everything starts at the sixth seal. I believe okay, everything. That's, I, okay. that's the start of everything, right? We're in the we're in the small t tribulation right now. 
right? In this world, you shall have tribulation, right? right. That's the promise to a Christian, yes. to every Christian. Exactly. But be of good cheer and overcome the world, right? John 16, 33. But that's not the, that's not the supernatural tribulation sure. that we're about to get into. I believe everything starts at the sixth seal, which would make sense, right? Because God says, when you're at, when that final martyr is killed, then I'm going to avenge you, right? That's what right. he's saying to them. But we just don't know when, right? God knows. And then look at what happens next. Yeah. Verse 12, right? And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, it's Jesus, yeah. and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, right? The veil is being removed. And every mountain and island were removed out of their place. And this is to me is what clinches it. It says, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, all the powerful people, the Illuminati, every free man, bondman, they hid themselves in the dens and the rocks and the mountains. And they said, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Wow. And this is the great tribulation. Yeah. That is the start of the great tribulation. And Jesus says that, even in Matthew 24. Yeah. He says that you'll be turned over to be killed. He's describing the fifth seal. And then he says... Uh, later on, and um, sorry, let me just get to that. Yeah. I'm Immediately gonna... after the tribulation of those days, and I believe that's the small t, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Shall be shaken. Everything that was just described in the sixth seal is in that verse. Yeah. Right? And what are those days? Jesus just described the first five seals, and he said that's the beginning of sorrows. He said the end is not yet. Right? He keeps telling them that's not the end. Right. It's the beginning of sorrows. He says, but after that's done, and you hear this earthquake that's going to shake heaven and earth shake. Right? This is a clearly divinely ordained earthquake. And the sun turns black. The moon turns to blood. He says, this is when. Now everything starts that's how you know it's the great tribulation right so they, they're they're running parallel to each other yes yes and, you know it's really they're really it really is completely parallel and then it goes on to talk about the sign of the son of man in the sky which i actually believe is the rapture i believe that when jesus says you shall see the sign of the son of man but it's actually right. referring to the raptured church and it's all in order and i believe yeah. that the sixth seal is when we are raptured so uh so yeah, so that's my that, that takes us to the seventh seal. I don't know if you want to talk about the seventh seal because I gave a very long speech. No, that's <laughs> that's that's amazing. That's amazing. I can, I, I can talk about the seventh seal if you want me to, but I know I gave a very long answer. So. No, no, you gave a phenomenal answer, right? I love <laughs> the parallels. The that the uh, types and shadows for me has always been like one of the things that I've I um gravitate to because that's really what the Bible's all about, you know. I mean, the old testament is the new testament, uh and but it gives it, us the confirmation it gives the confirmation yeah, exactly right? and, and and so that's how you can know right no scripture is of pr private interpretation sure right sure. so we can't just make think take some of our own opinion right yeah. god's using his word informs other parts of the word right god exactly. says when his word goes out and he says uh every word has a mate god says in his in, his, in the bible there's there's a match for everything wow. so we're in clearly Revelation 6 and Matthew 24 match with each other. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think, well, I'd love, I was going to say uh, one of the things that I really love of your teaching about your teaching is how um, you uh, talk about Exodus being the foreshadow of the great tribulation. So can you go into that just very quickly as well? I Yes, I'll, I'll go very quickly. <laughs> no, 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 because I want to go back to that seventh seal. I don't want oh, to, okay, yes, I don't sure. Sure. So, yeah, so, so I call, so I call the Great Tribulation the Second Exodus, right? Because there yeah. are really two things. Two things are happening in the Great Tribulation. It's the judgment of Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. They're all the kingdom of fallen angels. They're all being judged, and of course, the followers, the unbelieving ones who pledge, excuse me, their allegiance to the Antichrist. They're all going to be judged everyone's for all the rejection of god for taking the mark of the beast yeah excuse me i'm sorry but the second 
purpose that's being fulfilled in the Great Tribulation is the reconciliation of Israel, right? It's bringing Israel back to a full understanding of who Jesus is. Jesus said, ye shall not see me henceforth until you say, speaking to Israel, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So Jesus says, I'm not coming back until you really know who I am. And this, of course, he said, that was in uh, Matthew, this is in, uh, on the verge of being crucified. He said this. So he already knew their redemption was coming, of course, but it had to be their understanding of who he is, Yeshua yeah. HaMashiach. And so I call the Great Tribulation the Second Exodus for that part of it, because God is, that's what God was doing. If you think about the Exodus, God's punishing Egypt, right? He's punishing this evil empire led by a man who sees himself as a god, right? The pharaohs were gods in their mind. It has a serpent coming out of his forehead right. in his crown, right? Clearly, again, we talk about foreshadows of the <laughs> Antichrist, right? That seems to be a foreshadow. Wow. And he's leading his people to him, right? He's bringing his people out of this judgment to bring them to him. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, going to happen again with the end times believing remnant of Israel, that God is going to supernaturally protect them and lead them to salvation in him and at the same time he's judging the antichrist he's judging the end times pharaoh right is who is the antichrist and if you look into some of the judgments and again i'll, I'll be brief but egypt was judged with blood during the exodus there's a plague of blood and the red nile was turned to blood the waters are turned to blood a third of the waters in during the during the trumpet judgments yeah. all the waters in the vile judgments yeah. They are burned with the sun in the Exodus. There's the sun scorches men. Right. They had boils. Boils, right? In Exodus, there are boils on those who take the mark of the beast. Vile boils. There's a plague of darkness in the Exodus. There's darkness in the Great Tribulation. Right? We're seeing all these parallels. I won't go through all of them, but just think about this: What brought Pharaoh to finally let the Israelites go? Mm -hmm. Was the death of his son? The death, right? What will Jesus do when he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives? He's going to kill the final Nephilim, the son of Satan, the Antichrist. And that ends everything. That's it. Right? So, second Exodus. Second Exodus. <laughs> I was quick with that one. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Okay, seventh seal, and then we'll, do, we'll be done. How's that? Okay. Uh, so, the seventh seal. Uh, so, yeah. So, again, putting in the context of everything that we're saying, right? If, if you know, following this, this chronology that's taking us, that means that the, the Great Tribulation is just starting, right? It says there's silence, the seventh seal in heaven for the space of about a half an hour, right? A, a very strange, that is a very strange verse. Mm -hmm. And it's like about a half an hour. Like, what is that? Yeah. Right? Why, why, what? what it was like, what does that mean, right? It's very, very strange, right? And which, and I love strange. Right. So that's <laughs> a, I love everything strange. And so so what does this mean? What does this mean? And so I believe it is a divine sign of God preparing to really unleash judgment, to intervene, to enter into the earthly realm and start intervening directly. And how do I say this? Well, again. When you think about types and shadows, you know, the easiest place to think. Where have we seen this before? We see it in the book of Joshua. Okay. Right? God gives them, of course, Joshua. They're going to attack Jericho. And God gives them this battle plan, right? March around Jericho for seven days, right? And we're already seeing some parallels. Seven, right? There's seven, seven, seven of judgments in the book of Revelation. He says, March around seven days. And on the seventh day, right, March six days. And then on the seventh day, March seven times. So there's like two sevens. There's a right. seven days of marching and then seven times they march around Jericho on the seventh day. And what does Joshua say? He says, don't make a sound. Be silent. Right? Yeah. They had to be. So they're marching now, right? Jericho says Jericho was, everyone was locked up. They were behind their walls. They're scared because God, of course, has just defeated the Nephilim. Og and Sihon on their way here. So they're like, we don't want any part of this. What's going on here? These They have a supernatural being on their side who's killing yeah. the mightiest Nephilim in the promised land. And what do they do? They just march around in silence. They're not fighting, right? They're not They're not doing any fighting yet. That's right. For seven days. I mean, and you think about it, like, right, right? That is really 
that's like a gangster move. They're just like, <laughs> they're just gonna walk around your building and not make a sound. Very and you don't know when, you don't know what's gonna happen next. I mean, right. that is really frightening, yeah. but it's silence. Mm. And then of course, what do they say when they have a time, a shout. Yeah, right. Right, they start shouting and the walls come down. And so I believe that's again, a preview of Revelation. And think about it, right? What's happening? Joshua, Yeshua is coming oh, to attack goodness. and judge, right? And what do we see at the first trumpet? It says there's a mighty angel who has incense at the altar, right? Who can have the, who had the incense? Aaron did. Only the high priest can carry that. Right. Who's our high priest in heaven? Jesus. Joshua, yes. Yeshua. Yeshua, that's right. Right? Right after the silence, who's leading that attack? And what does he do with that, that censor? Cast it down to earth. He throws it down to earth to start the judgments. That's the first trumpet judgment. He casts it down to earth. And so I believe that silence is, is, is God's, it's almost like a solemn, no, it's almost like a moment of silence, really, right? We do that now, right? We say, let's take a moment of silence because we're acknowledging something somber has taken place. There's been a loss, a judgment, a death. And it's almost like a divine moment of silence before God is going to truly say, now I'm coming down and I'm really going to judge and I'm not going to stop, right? Once God started in, in Egypt, he didn't stop until yeah. he crumbled. And he, all the way to the Red Sea, God was doing everything, right? They could even, remember, God even used his own presence, the pillar to to block, to make it dark so the Egyptians couldn't catch up to the Israelites. So he, God, and that's what's happening in Revelation. Now it's like, it's almost like, they have a silence before God comes down. Mm -hmm. He's like, now I'm going down there and I'm fixing this for good. And I believe that's what that silence is for. And that's why you see that silence before yeah. the walls of Jericho come down. Beautiful. Next time we have you on the program, we have to go into the trumpets. And, <laughs> sure, uh, sure. Vials, all that kind of stuff. We have Habits to go into, uh, if you... If you think any of this UFO and alien phenomenon has anything to do with end times <laughs> prophecy as well, I'd love to pick your brain. I have a few things to well. say about that. I'm sorry. You said yes. I have a few things to say about oh, that. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I would love. So before before we uh we close off uh, in a little while, well after after we're finished with table talk, we'll have to schedule our. Our next, <laughs> our next yeah, table talk yeah. because I already have a ton of questions on my mind <laughs> for the next one, but that's definitely one on the on the books to talk about. Yes, Ryan, let the, our viewers know where they can find you, where they can support your work, your ministry, and sure. obviously uh, get all of the materials that you have out there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my my website is judgmentofthenephilim.com. Obviously one word, judgmentofthenephilim.com. And that's the easiest way to find me. Uh, of course, I have the books, Judgment of the Nephilim, The Final Nephilim. I have the companion study guides. I have documentaries on both books as well uh, that are available in DVD or in um, digital on-demand format. So you can find that all there. It's also available on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. Judgment of Nephilim is now on Barnes and Nobles. Final Nephilim is coming to Barnes and Nobles soon because some people prefer BNN over Amazon, which mm -hmm. is fine with me. And um, my uh, Facebook, my Instagram, and my YouTube channel are all Judgment of the Nephilim, one word. And that's the easy way to find me. So feel free to reach out, ask questions you may have. Um, I love to interact and Take questions, just have discussions. So yeah, that's that's uh that is how you can find them. I highly recommend uh the listening audience to uh get uh, both books and the study guides and obviously all the material that Ryan has out there because it'll answer a lot of your questions. Uh, I know that when I get done with some of these table talks, I get questions myself. So, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, some of which I can answer, and others I reserve for another Ryan Peterson <laughs> table talk. <laughs> no problem, no problem at all. Oh, and I should also mention because I get asked this all the time when I yeah. don't say it. Both books are available on Audible. On Audible, on Audible. I, I, if I many times when I talk about the books, I forget to mention that, and the first question I get is. Hey, are they in audio? And yes, they are in audio. Good. I narrated both books and they're available on audio on Audible. And I will add also, um, well, I'm in full, I'm in promo mode now. <laughs> both yeah. books have both audiobooks have exclusive bonus commentary in them. 
yes. that I gave. I talked about just uh, just different concepts I was thinking about as I was writing the book or mm -hmm. challenges I had or things I enjoyed. And also the final Nephilim uh, actually has a video bonus video content throughout the book, video commentary uh, throughout the book that is also exclusive to that book as well. That's so. one of my favorite things. You have the QR code. All you got to do is uh, click on that and and get yes, some more yes. material. And I'll also announce that I'm working actually, so believe it or not, it's hard for me to believe, but it's actually been five years uh, since Judgment of the Nephilim was published and uh, by God's grace. And um, I'm actually preparing a fifth five-year anniversary edition of Judgment of the Nephilim that's going to have about 10 hours of video content in it. So that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. Stay tuned good, for that. Good. Mm -hmm. Well, you know yeah. what we have to do is we've got to get your books in Spanish. Yes. That yes, has to happen. Yes. The Spanish uh, community <laughs> needs to hear, needs to read all of this uh, material. So yeah, that's absolutely absolutely and you know uh, that's something I, that it's been on my list <laughs> having got, haven't gotten that done yet i've been very busy uh with my day job yeah. but uh I, my my time has been freeing up a little bit so that's definitely on my list of projects that i want to take care of because you're right uh, it's it's yeah. it's needed it is it's needed. been expressed to me shout out to all my spanish-speaking brothers and sisters uh yes. hermanos uh who have who said that to me so yeah. I, I definitely, it's something I definitely will, will Lord willing, will make happen. This year, Lord willing. Pronto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, Ryan, thank you again for, for being with me tonight. And uh, for those of you that are listening, uh, please share this content, uh, like, subscribe, uh, go to Judgment of the Nephilim, subscribe to Ryan's channels, uh, follow him on his social media. He's got some great content on his Thursday night, obviously, uh, theology that he's got going on at times. And so I, I encourage you to uh, support uh, this ministry because he, uh, I'm telling you, the Lord is, the Lord's taking him to many places and he's been in conferences, which I'm believing in Jesus name that he'll come down to Florida and we'll have a nice, <laughs> great, awesome conference <laughs> together <laughs> with uh derek and sharon gilbert we were oh, talking about that great. the other day so i like it i like uh, it sounds as great well as dr laura we'd love to get you all together maybe a beautiful great panel so that we could uh just do a nice conference uh, down in the sure. south florida area i think it's very needed so um yeah. but thank you again thank you all for those of you that are listening and uh be sure to tune in for our next table talk and we'll see you again soon. So God bless you all. Take care.